Stiamo registrando. Okay, so thank you very thank you very much to everybody. Just a few words to introduce the, the speaker. Uh, he's a physicist, he's coming from Trento, PhD in Trento, some uh, years in MIT and in Paris. And the interesting part is he's a theoretical physicist. And also for me, it's pretty interesting to understand how this uh, background in theoretical, in strong theoretical physics can be related to pharmacological research. And so I'm here to, to I give you the word and thank you very much for being here. So first of all, thank you very much for being here for the introduction. It's a, it's a real pleasure also because I am uh, re oh, sorry, it's the wrong computer. I have recently joined the, the physics department here at Bicocca, so it's my first talk as a Bicocca faculty. And so it's kind of an occasion to let myself known and maybe get to know some of you. So as as uh, as uh, as Checo mentioned before, during the introduction, I'm a theoretical physicist, and, I, and when I was, okay, meglio così. Si sente meglio così? Okay. Okay, so, um, I'm a theoretical physicist. Um, during my PhD, I worked uh, in, uh, in the US, uh, in the University of, of Stony Brook, on things that are completely unrelated to what I will be talking today, except that they are completely related from the methodological point of view, as I will see. So some of the method that I learned as a PhD student in the US is sort of translated into applications to biophysics, and that will be what I will be mostly talking about. But don't worry, I will not be talking about any equations. I will be talking about their ideas today, because this is thought to be a colloquium for life scientists kind of audience, okay? Of course, if you have any technical reason, you ask a physicist about technicalities, he will be happy to have any technicalities for the rest of the afternoon. Okay, so I would like to spend a moment to, to, to describe and, and to comment on what is what I call the reductionist approach to molecular biology or to probability biology. So the idea is to uh, uh, not to take a top to bottom kind of approach to living life science related problems, but rather a reductionist approach in which you try to understand from as much detail as you can elementary process, and you try to combine this information to get some added value in the understanding of a complex system such as. <laughs> Okay, good. Um, so I was mentioning the reductionist approach. So, you know, biology is an intrinsically complex uh, problem where we have uh, thousands, if not th hundreds of thousands of actors simultaneously interacting with each other. So, at least to me, it wasn't clear at all in the very beginning that any physicist kind of simplification uh, paradigm, which you start from something you can understand, and then you build up bricks in order to get something that is more and more complicated, could ever have any chance to work. You know, you have a hundred objects that interact with one another, and you calculate each of these processes individually with a 1% error, you get a 100% error in the end, right? So, can we learn something from it? What I will try to argue in this seminar that uh, using molecular simulation, it is possible to uh, help the understanding by providing fundamental insights into elementary processes in, bi in molecular biology and possibly explain the mechanism of action of drugs and even inspire new therapeutic strategies, which is the core of this seminar. However, in order to do that, you cannot go vanilla, as they say in computer science, to the simplest possible approach. You really have to be as smart as you can to engineer advanced methods because there are challenges that immediately jump at you and prevent you to apply the conventional method. And I will discuss a little bit about that. Uh, 
So before going into that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about molecular simulation work, what they are, thinking about an audience that probably uh, doesn't have a background in, in this field. So in this chart, you see a plot over typical length scales and time scales, and we organize living organism or uh, even fundamental matter on this scale. You see, we sit on the top right corner, we have a reaction times within the fraction of a second, we have our cycles within the minutes or so, and we are more or less a meter, possibly two tall, right? As we, knew, we all know from high school that at this level, the laws of physics that we need to understand are essentially consequences of Newton's law of classical mechanics. And this, is the heart of the, what I will call taking inspiration from the Avenger sort of pop culture, the classical realm. And the classical realm extends very much in nature because as I go more and more microscopic, I look at systems that move faster and have smaller size, the laws of, of classical mechanics continue to work. You know, uh, these are an ant or bacteria, even at a cellular level, Everything you observe on a cell is completely well understood in terms of Newton mechanics. Maybe you cannot solve the equations, but in principle, that's what it is. Now, as you go to the opposite side, we know also from our previous education that if you go sufficiently microscopic, things break down and you enter what I will refer to as the quantum realm, where the laws of physics, don't, as we knew it from high school, don't apply anymore. Even this very simple concept of this object is here at this time. Uh, needs to be renegotiated and re-extending to understand the concept of probability, interference, and all concepts of quantum mechanics. So we are interested in fundamental macromolecular uh, interactions or transitions and transformations. So where do they sit on this chart? Now, interestingly enough, proteins, and I will take proteins as a paradigm here for the rest of this talk, sit right at the border of the quantum realm and the classical realm. They have one foot in one realm and one foot on the other. What do I mean by that? The motion of the nuclei, typically carbon, nitrogen, they are sufficiently heavy object to be well understood within the laws of classical mechanics. However, their interaction is due to the existence of electrons and the complicated network of phenomenology of electrons, the sharing of orbitals, everything you heard from your chemistry education. And those, of course, are not classically understood. So basically, cutting a complicated problem simple and perhaps oversimplifying a little bit. The idea is that the motion of the nuclei you can solve by solving Newton's equations, but the forces that these nuclei experiences and they keep them together or the, you know, the electrostatic interaction, they need quantum mechanics to be calculated. So typically what people do, they take very gross preliminary quantum mechanical calculations and then they refine the parameter to make sure that they agree with experiments. And then they pass this to codes to solve very complicated Newton's equation for, say, half a million particles, okay? Which is all the atom in a molecule and its solvent. Okay, this is, a, uh, this is called the multiscale approach where you use electronic structure calculation, you combine it with Newton, the laws of physics, and this was worth actually the 2013 Nobel Prize for Physics uh, because it was demonstrated this seemingly hopeless approach actually works pre pretty well, as I will show. So, uh, what can you do with molecular simulations once you have it? And again, oversimplifying, I would say you can answer two main questions. Well, probably you can answer more if you go into material science, but I'm going be specifically focused here to life science. And the two main questions you can ask is, answer is a where and a how. So let's see what do they mean. Where is basically, given a chemical structure, a molecule, where does this chemical system want to be? In other words, what is the thermodynamically stable conformation of a given macromolecule or macromolecular system? As a paradigmatic example, take protein folding, the protein sequence structure relationship. You gave me the sequence of amino acids of a protein. We know that for reasons that are physics related, 
Amphizyme and co-worker showed in 1963, protein can refold spontaneously to unique stable conformation and therefore go somewhere in the space of possible conformation. And the relationship between the chemistry and the position in the conformation space is an answer to a where question. And we all have heard probably recently that there was a major breakthrough into this problem. The understanding, predicting the stri sequence structure relationship was on the desktop of physicists and chemists for many, many decades with relatively no success or little success. But very recently, artificial intelligence and machine learning have broken a wall and were for the first time able to give systematic accurate prediction within say above 80% accuracy between sequence structure relationship, which was of course a big splash in the news, right? But along with the word question, there's also another interesting question, which is the how question. So given that something happens, for instance, this is a model for PRP, the prion protein interconversion into some model of the scrappy form, the pathogenic form that is responsible for the Metcalfe disease. Um, how does it happen? Or if you want, with a metaphor, given that you know we are all in Milan at this time, and for some reason we get to know that we will be only all of us will be in uh, Rome by tomorrow at noon. Which route is most likely to be taken by some of us? Now, will we stop in Florence or in Pisa, okay? Or other ways. So how do I get there? And again, if you understand the process like amylogenetics, so I have a problem, always had a problem pronouncing this word, transitions, then of course you, you gain a wealth of information that you can sort of use to inspire therapeutic strategies. Now, in this talk, I will be focusing on the how question and I will not touch the where question. So bear this in mind. Uh, and as a matter of fact, as far as protein is concerned, it turned out the physics-based simulations are not well equipped for the where questions. They become too hard for the where question. Uh, why AI has been much more efficient in that. But they, a physics-based question can be physics-based approach can be very useful for the how question, provided you know the answer to the where question. So that's the point of my talk. Uh, let me explain. But before you go into there, let me tell you that the models that I described, you actually, in principle, can solve both questions. Now, what you see here is a supercomputer that was uh, engineered and constructed specifically to perform only molecular dynamic simulations. So you cannot open a browser on that computer, right? You can only do these simulations. Why? Because by engineering everything on the chip, they could gain a factor 2000 in the time for, uh, um, window that they could simulate by integrating Newton's equation. Now, a factor 2000 was enough to scratch the millisecond time scale, which is the smallest time scale where some fundamental biological processes occur, so that they could use this computer to validate this. Okay, for instance, these are 12 mini proteins. They are specifically, they are basically protein fragments. They have zero biological interest, but they are the smallest systems that have native uh, protein-like properties. They fold to unique native states, and they have a folding rate within the millisecond, very often in a few tens of microseconds. So since this supercomputer enabled us to scratch the millisecond time scale, it could be used to see whether the model that I told you about before can predict the folding native states and the rates and the how question. And in fact, in 2010, the scientists from the Shore Research we're able to show that this is in fact the case. You see two structures here. One is the experimental crystal structure. The other one is being predicted and they agree. And although you cannot read, even the time scales are very much close considering how difficult it is to produce and predict folding rates. Oh, that's great. So we have a tool, we can solve both questions. And the answer is no. Why not? I keep on using the wrong computer because of the rare event problem. Now, without talking thermodynamically, let me just mention that every transition that occurs in biochemistry, essentially, occurs in an on-off kind of way, technically overcoming a free energy barrier, which means the system spends a very, very long time 
as a matter of fact, a doubly exponentially long time relative to the transition time in one state, and then trying, basically tossing a coin over and over, trying to find a way to go to the other state. And this is all, the answer is always no. Wrong, 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 wrong. But once you get the sequence of yes, 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 it takes a couple of microseconds to get to the other side. It's like trying to get a little ball, go through a, just a tiny opening in the door by shooting randomly. Most of the time you, you don't get the exit, but once you get the exit, it gets out in a minute, in a second, in a split second, okay? So as a result, all of your computational time goes here, right? Typically everything you got. So you take your supercomputer, you spend your 2,000, 200 million dollars to develop, you run three months, and you basically see something like going from here to here. You see nothing. Okay. But what you really want to see is if this is a protein folding transition, which I will use as a prototypical example, also because it will enter later in my discussion, is the how question. What happens during the transition? Okay, this is the rare event problem. Now, the rare event problem is ubiquitous in physics, chemistry, and therefore it's been tackled with a zoology of methods. And I will not play justice to any of them if I start reviewing them. They are different, but more or less, they all have a common feature. And the common feature they have is that they capitalize on some a priori available information to speed up the simulation. Now, we get, I can get more technical of what kind of priori information you need but let me not do this at this level, let's keep the flow, right? But you need to know something to get something. For instance, in our case, you need to know the crystal native structure. And you need to make more or less sure how the reaction should go on a qualitative level, which in the case of protein is evidence has shown that you tend to form native contacts and never break the native contacts along the folding pathway. This is an exper experimental information that has been accumulated over years. Now, this is a priori information. In principle, the computational scheme that I told you about should be able to give it to you, but you cannot solve it with this because of computational limitations. So you have to use this additional information. Sorry. We need to use this efficient information. Now, all of these methods somehow use but they are applicable to different problems. In fact, none of them works for protein folding. Okay, the protein folding of biologically relevant protein is too complicated for that. And we came into this game from nuclear physics side, and you don't have to understand this equation, don't be scared. I will tell you why I put it there. We came into nuclear physics, into this game from nuclear physics, and we realized that we could use this knowledge to understand to develop algorithms that in fact allows us to use the scheme of real information uh, accelerated to get accurate prediction for protein folding pathways of arbitrary size. Okay, so why from nuclear physics? In nuclear physics, there's a weird phenomenon that is called quantum tunneling. What is quantum tunneling? A particle is in a well, classically it can go nowhere if it doesn't have enough energy. However, quantum mechanically, every so often, it tunnels through the barrier, ends up like that. Nuclear fission works like this, okay? Unstable nuclei, every, time, every so often, they break spontaneously. Now, it turns out the physicists, this is an important problem for nuclear physics, as you can imagine, and physicists have developed very advanced mathematical formalism and approximations to deal with that over the years. And in fact, as a matter of fact, uh, my PhD was about kind of using this mathematical formalism to understand new subnuclear processes. Now, it turns out that there is a very similar problem that in, 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 the, in the physics of system we are interested in, in, in biophysics, which is particles that don't go under the barrier because they are classical, but because of thermal fluctuations, they get kick from the environment, right? That gives energy to them. And if you're so lucky that you get a kick always in the same direction in the high dimensional space, you end up on top of the mountain and then you can roll down. This is why molecular transitions are so rare. They're thermally activated. You have to wait for the right sequence of lucky fluctuations to happen. But the mathematical formalism, there is 
hidden in books, we discovered, not discovered by ourselves, but we found hidden in books that the mathematical formalism to describe thermal activation could be framed in a way that is very similar to the one that is being used to study tunneling. So this was the key to crack the code, if you want. We have a mathematical formalism, and now we can apply everything we have learned about how to exploit the equations for quantum tunneling and try to use this knowledge to adapt them and further develop it to get new ways to tackle the problem that we are really interested in, fluctuation that gets you on the, side, on the other side of a barrier, okay? So that was our starting point that led to 15 years of research, of course. Here's a, a number of papers that we publish on physical relators and PNAS over the years, in which we keep on developing. And technically, these are variational approximations. And the word variational is where you, um, where you hide the fact that you need some prior understanding about the system to solve it. Okay, then there is some approximations involved, like in all variational approximations, and I will not go into that. I'll be happy to discuss this later. But we could, now, at least numerically speaking, you, give, you provide our method to a computer and we fold the protein in an afternoon, okay? With the same model that, you know, Anton takes three months. So the first thing we did was to check that we get the same result of the famous Anton computer on those 12 proteins that the Anton computer could solve, okay? So we go and look at those test cases and what this plot shows is that basically I will not describe them to you, but the essence of this is that the folding pathways that people discovered by plain molecular dynamics simulation, brute force molecular dimension on that supercomputer are statistically indistinguishable from the ones that we generate in one afternoon on four GPUs, okay? Now, the other point is that the scalability of our algorithm is only logarithmic. So basically, once you can do mini protein, you can do 600 amino acids at a relatively small computational uh, relative cost. So basically, what we have access with our method is all of what I call the biozone system with sizes that ranges from hundreds of amino acids and extends even to hours. And this is essential because it's nice. Of course, because we want to study biological problems, but also because we want to validate your method against experiments. There is no validation against simulation. Let's remember that. Simulation is nice to have, but ultimately only experiment is what validates a method. So the first thing, but before I go into tell you some ideas, just to give you an idea, this is the folding mechanism of a protein that is a 600 amino acids. And if you were to use the famous Anton supercomputer, you should have started the simulation 250,000 years ago to see one single event. Is this magic? No, because we do not predict the native state. The supercomputer would predict the native state. There's no free lunch. We just take some information that we have, we happen to have, and find a smartish way to capitalize the more as much as possible on that information so that we can save on everything else. We know the answer to the where so we can answer the how, okay? Why well, Anton in principle doesn't know either question, doesn't need neither pieces of information, Gets, just, just needs to know the Luthor's law. Okay, so once you can solve basically problems that are unsolvable, the first thing we did was to check against detailed uh, biophysical experiment. These are optical experiments with different groups. Uh, we couple classical and quantum mechanical calculation. I will not go into details. Here you see sets of points. There are pairs of points that I agree, just to give you an idea. These are threat signals for those who know what they are uh, in a time resolved manner, meaning they monitor in how the folding occurs in time. And one is the prediction and the other one is the experiment that we can quantitatively agree. So the bottom line of this series of validation is that we can actually predict folding pathways much more accurately than we thought. And we discover by doing that, probably not discover people, thought it could have been possible, but we were the first one to actually be able to see it, is that the folding pathway always occurs by going, as you go close to the native state, there are some extremely well-conserved folding intermediates. It's like every train that goes to Rome stops in Florence, of almost every train. That's the kind of information we get. And we know exactly the position of the train in Florence. Okay, so that's the added information we have. 
Okay, the, the next kind of validation is a biochemical validation. You have this method, you try to understand phenomena that you couldn't understand before. I'll give you an example. This is an androgen receptor protein. And interestingly enough, it only folds upon binding to the hydrogen, and it's degraded by foliobiquitation, by phosphorylation of a consensus site uh, as, as normal phosphorylation by kinases. Now, the consensus size is buried in the native state. So kinases cannot phosphorylate. How do they challenge the protein to degradation? It's just deeply buried in the native state. What we discovered by simulation is the protein folds, stops in Florence. In Florence, the consensus size is open and the pocket is ready. Now, if first comes the androgen, protein goes, goes to the native state. If first comes the kinases, protein gets phosphorylated and goes to the degradation pathway. So this is a kind of an example of things you couldn't know before that our simulation started to suggest, and we are going on to validate this hypothesis because remember, this is not a virtual microscope. We do not have the ambition to tell you this is how nature works. This is just a machine to develop, to, to devise possible testable hypotheses that are physics-based. Then you have to pass this hypothesis to the biologists to move on. You don't stop there, okay? Okay, but then once you understand that perhaps Mother Nature uses Holding the intermediates for regulatory roles, which is still an hypothesis we have to validate and extend. By the way, we discovered that more than 15% of the phosphoproteome have a consensus size that it buried into the native state. So, you know, maybe this is a general mechanism and evolutionary it appeared later, but I don't want to sort of burn. This is the subject of our print that we'll be studying. But anyway, once you understand or have a glimpse that uh, major nature uses this for these reasons, then maybe you can exploit it pharmacologically. So for instance, suppose you have a protein that uh, goes to internative state and you're able to, to recognize all the stations that the protein stops. And maybe there are pockets that are only exposed in the intermediate states, but they are not exposed in the native state. What you can do, you can design a small drug, a small molecule that binds into one of these pockets and prevents the rest of the folding to occur. Now the quality control of a cell recognizes this as a partially folded or misfolded species and starts the degradation pathway. You let the, the, the cell do the dirty work. We call this principle, which we patented a few years ago, uh, PPI fit, pharmacological protein activation by folding intermediate targeting, which qualifies for the worst possible acronym you can think of, okay? So again, this is the idea. So in, in a cartoon, uh, there are many ways of doing drug discovery. The, the conventional one is acting on the native state and trying to impair the, you know, the active side of a protein. Recently, as you well known, there are other alternatives such as gene editing, for example, that act upstream in the fundamental dogma of biology. And we notice there is an empty space there and stick our place there, right? So we try to pharmacologically inhibit protein folding. So does it work? Let's see. The first thing we wanted to do was to work on a protein. Now, okay, to be honest, one way to say that is that we wanted to work on a protein that is undruggable with conventional methods. The truth is this method was invented with Emiliano Biasini, who I'll mention later, and we are 50% co-inventors. Uh, we've been brothers of arm in these uh, adventures ever since uh, we collaborated. He's a biologist and, and he's a prion expert. So, of course, he had all, all the expertise and the biological essay is ready to study. So that's the real reason why we look into prion. But, okay, so prion protein, I don't need to tell you what the prion protein is. You probably should tell me. Uh, we know it's associated with, uh, you know, neurodegenerative diseases that are invariably lethal. And you have this idea of templating and propagation by templating, recruiting uh, PRP protein. Uh, substrate for PRSC, scrapey form. And this is the PRP protein, the wealthy form, the healthy form. And there basically is no binding pocket. Every attempt that has been done to degrade the prion protein or to stop the uh, fibrin propagation uh, pharmacologically 
uh, has systematically failed. And one of the reasons is basically, certainly there's no pocket available. Well, there is one that only works in 100 micromolar, which of course, it's not a binding pocket, it's just something slightly more sticky, but even those didn't work. So we tried as a first proof of concept our idea. We simulated the folding of the prion protein. We looked at the folding pathway. This is just a cartoon on two collective variables. There is an intermediate there. Here is Florence. Okay. We structurally characterized Florence, and then we looked for binding pockets, if this wakes up, binding pockets that are only exposed in Florence and not in the native state. And once we found some that were interested enough, we looked, uh, we ran a very, very uh, preliminary, we had very little uh, say resources at the time, uh, uh, drug screening campaign, until we find a couple of proteins, uh, small molecules that were supposed to bind. And then of course we go into the lab. And the first thing you want to do, you want to show that when you provide this small molecule, molecule to a cell that, has, that expresses PRP protein, you want the expression levels of PRP to go down in a dose-dependent fashion. And that's exactly what you see here. This is a Western blot, of course. You see, as you go down uh, the density, as you, uh, you, you, according to the density of small molecule, the expressions goes down. And of course, you have to show that you have a IC difference. In other words, that this is not by toxicity. Is you know, there's a difference on the concentration where the cell die and the concentration where you see the effect. Otherwise, you know, they die and therefore they don't express PRP. Right, and this is the relative level, but of course this was not good enough. You have to start doing challenge your 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 model with alternative explanations. So the first thing we did, we look at other proteins that have an identical biogenesis. They are expressed directly into the IR. They go through the Golgi and then they are GPI anchored to the cell surface, and then they have a regular. A, a, they then, then after the turnover time, they get back to the degradation pathway. So identical uh, biogenesis, but very different structure and sequence. And our molecule was doing nothing to them. Okay, so it doesn't get on the way of the biogenesis. Uh, here is an interesting, we see how the molecular concentration works. Uh, in normal conditions, uh, PRP gets anchored to the cell. So when you do a GPI, when you have a green fluorescent protein uh, attached to it to watch it by fluorescence, you see basically the cell contour. And as you move on, you see that the cell contours uh, disappear and you get some blobs. And these are, as we will show, uh, very likely correlated with the degradation centers of the cell, as you would expect from the model. Now, I will go relatively quick on the rest of the biochemical evidence, trying to hide the fact that I'm not a biochemist, but if you ask me, maybe I can still defend myself after hearing this from Emiliano many, many times, but the next thing we wanted to see is that our molecule only acts on nascent proteins, right? So how do we do that? By using inducible cell. You can stop the production of PRP protein in the cell chemically. So for instance, if you let the protein stop the production, you wait a few hours so that now all the proteins are in the and are still within the turnover time, so they're still all expressed, but you don't get nascent proteins, right? And then you put the molecule in, nothing happens. The molecule has no effect. Now you wait some more. All the cells, the, all the PRP proteins that were in the cell gets washed away by the turnover. Now you start inducing again, now you act in all your nascent player, uh, protein, and you get maximum effect, okay? These are the kind of essays that we did. Another uh, interesting experiment that we could show that uh, by subministrating this, protein, this molecule to the cell, you trigger autophagy-related pathways, which is what you expect because we want to induce protein degradation. Okay? And then going forward, it doesn't act on RNA. So you don't stop the RNA transcription, you're really acting post-transcriptionally. Okay, and doesn't control negative com proteins. Well, these I already mentioned. Most importantly, a data that I forgot to mention, you stop the propagation of prion in the cell. So basically you have prion propagation, you put this molecule and 
actually not only the propagation stops, but you can see a slight reduction of pathogenic aggregates in the cell. Is this a cure for prion? Certainly not. It's the starting point to develop a molecule. So one, at this point, one sideline went into doing the hit to lead development of these small molecules, trying to let them become a drug. And this is the one avenue we are actually following at the moment. Of course, this is the avenue where Emiliano Biasini is the boss because he's a perinologist. But this method and patent led to the founding of a company, which I want briefly to mention, uh, Sibylla Biotech. It was uh, founded in 2017, but remained latent for two years until we found the first 2.4 million investment for venture capital funds, so private investors, essentially. And we moved forward, and in 2022, we got a second investment by 23.5 million. So now we really have a good lab proper lab to work with. Actually, this is the second largest investment in biotech uh, startups in Italy ever by half a million, so almost the first. I'm very proud to say that in 2021, Nature uh, included Sibyl among the eight most promising startups worldwide in biotech and wrote two paper about Sibylla. So this is two paper that came out about our technology uh, written by Nature on our technology. And of course, very relevant, Sibylla moved to Milan basically in a month ago, one month ago. There was a kickoff meeting a couple of weeks ago. Now the lab is entirely in Milan at the Open Zone hub in Bresso. But of course, Sibylla went on further validating both the underlying science and looking at different targets. And it was immediately discovered that uh, this method works for basically almost all the targets you could think of. These are similar results for cyclin D1, which is one of the uh, holy gray of breast cancers because it is undragable with conventional methods and goes down like a stone with our method. Okay? And started partnership with Nature Pharma, Takeda's, for instance. And most importantly, as a physicist, further develop the technology because. Uh, the computational team, which is based on people that have your age, uh, they came from my lab, but then grow autonomously, demonstrated one fundamental principle of science. When your students are better than you, the best thing you can do is get out and let them work because they went and challenged. We always had, we, we had to face the elephant in the room and the elephant in the room is protein don't fold in a vitro, they fold called translationally. And this is an essential part. You can get the florence very nicely if the protein refolds in vitro, but what about when it comes out of the ribosome? But, but simulating protein folding in atomistic resale, coming out from the night, using our methods, coming out for the ribosome was to me too challenging, but they wanted to try. And guess what? They succeed. So this is not a cartoon. This is what Sibylla does at this moment, and this is the result of all atom molecular dynamic simulations. Of course, they had to further develop the technology that we started academically. So this is now industrial technology. And as you can see in the simulation, which is a little bit uh, not very fluent because of the screen, but I can give you the movie, uh, which is of course much more fluent. You can really predict co-translational mechanism. Now this particular folding it doesn't have any folding intermediates, that's why we show it. Uh, but the ones that we use pharmacologically have their flooring station, which we uh, characterize, okay? Okay, it looks very nice, but there are many things that are not quite there. Do I have 15 minutes, 10 minutes? 10, okay. First of all, the smoking gun. We would like to have a picture of the binding pocket and the small molecule attached to it by crystallography. Unfortunately, co-crystallizing folding intermediates with the ligand is technically impossible on Earth because folding intermediate states are highly hydrophobic and they aggregate like hell and they precipitate like hell. So every attempt we did failed miserably in a matter of seconds. Everything crashed immediately. 
precipitate sounds like gravity, right? So why not go into space? So we designed an experiment that will be launched on August 1st and mounted on International Space Station, because in space, it is well known that aggregation is much slower and, and there is no precipitation, obviously. Where do you precipitate? Right. You are in free fall conditions. So this is called the Zeprium experiment. The Zeprium experiment, the Zeprium 1, will be launched August 1st. It should, should have been launched a year and a half ago. It has been delayed due to NASA schedules or whatnot. But now they confirmed the launch on August 1st, and nothing crazy happens. So we designed basically a small chip together with Space Pharma, uh, space Pharma is a world leader in space-based technology for, for life science application, in which you basically you do, uh, you know, you get the unfolded protein, you get your small molecule, and then you try to build a crystal on remote. And we will start this experiment soon and see what we got. We have already planning to capitalize on the failure, which I think we'll have on the first attempt uh, to get the second experiment. And ASA is already pre um, approved Zeprium 2, uh, the European Space Agency, and given some potential funding that we are negotiating now for Zeprium 2. Okay. Is this everything? Of course, provided that we get the, the smoking gun, can we claim problem solved? Let's go on. Uh, no, because the algorithms that I discussed worked very nicely from protein folding because we know the crystal structure, but also we have a, lot, a fairly good understanding of the statistical physics of protein folding, which means we more or less understand how protein folding works in general. What we lack is complete detail, but as a general picture, it, fo it falls basically by creating native contacts and accumulating native contacts. But this is definitely not the case for other macromolecules or for other processes. And the methods at which we developed do not work or may not work for any problem because we need the right a priori information. So of course it would be fantastic to, to tackle other interesting problems here at the sun if we could get rid of the priori information. Now, of course, sounds like magic. Rather than get rid is, well, for those who are a little bit more technical, we would like not to be able to make an ad hoc variational ANSATS. We would like to use no bias enforcer whatsoever. Uh, so we would like the simulation to be more independent, to grow up and get out on their own, right? Now, of course, to do that, we need to walk and put something new onto the table because everything that you can already have on the table, we've been tried quite extensively and the community has done their effort. So over the last three years, two years and a half, my um, uh, lab work has been mostly in trying to get this extra uh, using data-driven machine learning, and in particular unsupervised learning, combined with theoretical physics, uh, further developing the math, I will not tell you what, and very recently asking the question if this is a new technology but certainly not emerging now, people use AI already, quantum computing is still on the making, but there are prototypes of quantum computer you can play with. So the question is, can we combine all these three ingredients to get the missing point? And I will spend the last five minutes to tell you where we are along this path. But in order to understand why, so why do you want machine learning? Is because by in a data-driven way, we ask the machine to explore as much as possible. So basically, a, a learn a machine learning algorithm can be engineered to understand where you have already looked. Right? Basically, you're Policino-like. You drop something and you recognize that you've been there. Okay, very good. But why a quantum computer should ever help solve this problem? This is a classical problem. And I, I could imagine using a quantum computer to study a quantum problem. A quiz is a quantum computer for a classical problem. So I will give you a two-minute introduction to quantum computing. To give you a two-minute introduction to quantum computing, let me start with classical computing. Classical computing works on the binary system. We all know. You get a number of wires, micro wires, which can be, which can be in two states of tension. Zero, low, which is zero. High, that is one. And by combining all the zero and ones, you can code the numbers, letters, operations, and blah, blah. So it's like you all know what is the Schrodinger cat, right? The, the paradigm for quantum mechanics that is at the same time 
dead and alive, right? A classical computer doesn't work with Schrodinger cats or, or Schrodinger or, or, or Schrodinger beats, right? It, it works with beats or cats that are either one alive or zero dead. A quantum computer works with the Schrodinger cat. It has quantum systems that can be zero, one, but it can be both things at the same time with a given probability, just as much as a Schrodinger cat. So a quantum computer is a collection of microscopic Schrodinger cat that can be manipulated and converted, and you can change the probability to be zero and one by using gates just much as you do with normal computer circuits. Okay, so I will write a state of a quantum bit qubit as some probability to be zero plus some probability to be one using the standard notation of quantum mechanics. So why is this useful? Suppose you have your pathway and here I have already done some pre-processes in which you have an initial state, a final state, and you have a, a huge number, not just a handful, of possible intermediate states that you have discovered by exploring with artificial intelligence. And then you use theoretical physics to build a network that tells the relative probability to go to from each point to the next. So then you have a network that represents the kinetics, but it's a huge one. So a classical computer struggles to find good paths in this. Okay. Now suppose you assign a bit to be one if the protein, if the path goes from here to here, say this is Milan, this is Bologna, okay, and this is Bologna to Florence, and zero because you don't go to Padua for example, right? Now, in a large network, you will have to put one bit here, one bit here, one bit here, one bit here, and you will have two to the n combinations. Classical computer will struggle even to memorize those combinations because put n equal a thousand and try to do two to the 1000 on your computer, you very rapidly exceed any possibility. Now, it turns out you can use quantum computer and encode all these possible paths in a single quantum state of the computer. Because each of these is simultaneously zero and one with a certain probability. So one of the advantage of quantum computer is you can get an exponential advantage in storing possible states with a relative probability. So we devised algorithms in which we initially prepare the state of the quantum computer in a state that contains all possible paths. And then we do something on the quantum computer, whatever it is, to promote the probability of observing a path that has a large probability. That's where theoretical physics comes in to tell you what to do on the quantum computer. And then we take a measurement. And when you take a measurement, you will get back one path. One of the possible highly probable paths. Okay, does it work? I didn't mention any ansatz at this level. I didn't mention any of the prior information, except yes, you need to know the initial and final point, but you don't need to make any extra kernels. So we check this, semi last slides. Of course, we start the simple. This is a D-peptide, is the first thing, is the hydrogen atom. The simplest thing you can do with proteins, two alanine. So you can solve it by MD on your desktop. And what this picture shows that the underlying valleys and mountains are obtained from molecular dynamic simulations. These points is my network. And you see the, where the points get red is where you want to go, and you discover that you actually want to go precisely through the transition state. That's where you expect to go. So alanine dipeptide, which is the trigger example, worked nicely. This plot here shows something that is mysterious perhaps for some of you, but it's crucial for this community. It does that with zero autocorrelation time, which is the limiting factor is that you may get one path but then to get a completely different one will take you an exponentially long time on a classical computer. Because you only perturb this path and you start perturbing, perturbing, but before you get the constant completely different, it takes forever. Now, anytime you reset the quantum computer, every qubit becomes a superposition of, of Schrodinger cats. So anytime you make a measurement, you get a completely fresh path, which means the autocorrelation is zero. This is one of the key advantage of using quantum computing. But then we went on and said, okay, we, so we solved something that molecular dynamic simulation could do. Can we solve something that only Anton can do so we can still validate, but it's not a trivial problem. So it somehow is a D-wave, the quantum computer against Anton, like alien versus predator. Okay, and yes, this is 
an energy landscape computed from Anton, and this is an internal transition of a protein that performs a very rare rearrangement in the native state. And what this line is, is the prediction of the quantum computer that actually travels along the low energy region. So it really does what you expect it to do. And then we got, I say, okay, so now we want to do something that Anton cannot do. So we use artificial intelligence to explore more. And this is the full folding pathway of that protein. This is what Anton could simulate. This is what we could simulate with our calculations. Now, we haven't fully validated this. I'm just showing that it can be done. Whether it can be done accurately, the future will tell. So we not make promises. But just want to say that there's some, the point here is not if quantum computer can save the world tomorrow, but is molecular simulation a field where we can start thinking how to use quantum computers? Will they be beneficial or not? Let's wait. But at least we can start using them for these purposes. Okay. Okay, I'm done. Just a few couple of final remarks. Uh, I think we are, most of us would agree that we are well into the age of cross-disciplinary science. And this is fantastic. To be your age now is so exciting, I think, because you really have a change of paradigm. In my age, science was becoming more and more specialized. Now it's really broadening up, which opens to new opportunities, new, new PhDs, such as the one you have here. OK, there are even new emerging op uh, opportunities from combining the emerging technology, from space-based technology to quantum computers to AI. So we are in a little bit in the age of pioneers that have uh, uncharted territory to look at. Uh, but this doesn't come without challenges. You need to talk to people that don't have your background. And this takes time. It, it took us time. Emiliano Bexini and I, uh, who basically used to have a joint lab when I was in Trento, now we have a virtually joint lab, took years to learn to work together because of this. And most importantly, you need to understand the limitation of each field. For instance, molecular simulations are not the answer. They are an uh, inspiration to find the answer. Okay, as a last slide, I'd like to mention that I have had a lot of incredible collaborators here. I listed those that I think gave the important contribution to the last project on PPI FIT, but there are so many others that I should thank. One of all is, of course, Emiliano, who's being responsible 50% for everything I said uh, about uh, uh, drug discovery and is most important collaborator ever. So I will never stop thinking of him. And I think uh, I'm done. I'm ready to take any question. So thank you very much. It's open for questions. Let me say from the beginning that uh, it belongs to the Department of Physics, but uh, is, is also an office in the ground floor U28. So I, I guess that you're very welcome to everybody that can be asked. Uh, so. If, uh, is there any question? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, very thrilling. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Florence story as a way to uh, explain, well, to identify mechanisms by which drugs could uh, uh, prevent protein folding. Uh, I am a channel, ion channel physiologist, and uh, it's a frequent observation that mutant channels that do not fold properly can be brought to function by ligands that are normally blockers of the channel. So uh, I think your Florence story applies to that. Do you agree? Physically chaperons, molecules that are uh, molecular chaperons that they are supposed to block the channel. So the channel should maybe go to the membrane, but not be conductive. But they bring the channel to the membrane and the channel is still conducting. So the, the, the function, yeah. yeah. This is a fantastic question, uh, observation. Uh, we have began to think about molecular chaperone and we at some point try to understand ion channels but we didn't put enough resources in that because in the meantime, uh, the story here was going too fast that we had too little resource to look into that. But this is certainly something we want to invest in the future, so I'd love to 
uh, have a chance in the future to sit down and understand better your problem and see whether we can do something about it. Eliane, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a couple of questions. One is, uh, when you mention at the current stage you say, of course, we need external information about the initial and the final state. Uh, the final state is relatively easy to characterize, but the initial is not. So uh, the question is, how heavily is your answer affected by the model you use for the unfolded state? This is another very good question, which we uh, looked into carefully. So this, my answer is divided in two. If you are thinking about refolding, then of course your question strictly applies. Because when you have refolding, meaning you denaturate a protein, you let it refold, you, you need to understand what that is. So what we did, of course, uh, it's a difficult question to answer because the structure of the unfolded state is precisely very difficult to get. So what we did, we tried many different ways to unfold the proteins. Right. We use thermal dilatation, we use stretching and relaxation, we did everything we could think of. And what we discover is that basically, again, with a metaphor, uh, you start from different places around here in Brianza and Milan, but as soon as you get to Pavia, paths are all the same. Okay. Uh, of course, then there are always situations, change the pH, change whatever. And most importantly, in the cell, you get a crowded environment and everything could change. Now, when you get to uh, try to make one step closer to living organisms, then of course you have the folding occurs cross translationally. And that solves, solves the problem because you always go through the constriction site and get out of it. And so the real question is whether you start folding in the constriction site or once you get out of the constriction site and in the, or in the vestibulus. And our data seems to imply that the folding started in the in vestibulus. And then we discovered there was a paper that showed exactly what was going on. We simulate that very protein. This is all unpublished data because it's Sibelius know-how. So they will decide when to release this. But basically, they get very strong compelling validation that the mechanism was actually compatible with all the available experimental information that was there. And the other question is about uh, specificity, because uh, I wonder uh, mm, towards paralogs, uh, similar sequences in, 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 the same, in the same proteome. Uh, be, because you discuss specificity towards similar um, biosynthesis, biosynthetic pathway, but what about similar sequences? Uh, have you considered paralogs and, and specificity towards? So, first of all, this is a second very, very important question. I, I actually go one step further. What if all you need is to have some hydrophobic patches exposed and you stick the molecule to a completely opposite regime where you're completely unspecific. And it looks like you're not. It's, it's, it's very specific because not only is the chemical sequence determines the structure of the intermediate, obviously. So uh, if you have two sequences that are completely unrelated, they go to a completely different native state, of course, they will not go to Florence because one goes from, say, uh, Moscow to pay Beijing, and the other one goes from Milan to Florence to Rome, and there's no reason why Moscow to Beijing should stop in Florence, right? So when you get completely different proteins, the problem of specificity is not there. The real problem of specificity is when you have variants of the same proteins. And this is typically what happens with cancer-related proteins, and this is one of the factors of resistance of cancers. Say the KRAS are prototypical. You have a number of KRAS, one of them boosts up during cancer proliferation, but there are the two are there. Now, what I'm, with chemotherapies, I'm talking about something I obviously don't understand, but I pretend I do. When you have a, you know, when you try to pull down the effect of one of the RAS, typically the other one jump up. But now you would like, but you cannot turn them down, all of the three, because otherwise the cells die. Now, this is the problem. Now, what happens is that the structure of the folding intermediates might contain amino acids that are different between the three, if you're lucky. And if this happens, the affinity of a given small molecule to the different variants is different. And for one of the proteins that I cannot mention, we see exactly this. Okay, so extremely specific. Uh, 
But I'll go one step further. When you do drug discovery, you go to hit to lead development. So you basically want to modify your drug to A, enhance potency, B, increase solubility, deliverability, and blah, blah, blah. So this is the information where you take uh, as an input the pocket structure, both chemical and structure, and then you make predictions on how you can modify, say, for increasing potency, right? Now, for this to happen, you, it means, for this to work, it, it requires you to know very well the binding pocket and the binding pose. Now, our hit to lead studies in Sevilla uh, are incredibly successful. Well, they are more successful than average on native state. Most, I, probably this was just a fluctuation, but certainly they are not less successful which means that we seem to have a very good prediction of bike in pocket, which is specific now, chemically specific. Okay, thank you very much. Let me say that we have a reserve at the table at the Aquilina. So if you are, anybody of you is completely free to join us if you want to continue the discussion. Thank you very much. And uh, it was very stimulating. <laughs>